started. All right, so special welcome to everyone who is tuning in. Happy New Year as well. I hope that 2016 ends up being a great year for everybody. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in for an EBFA webinar, thank you for tuning in and supporting EBFA and our free educational webinar series. If you are familiar with EBFA and you've attended one of our workshops or any of our webinars, then welcome back as well. So the way that this is going to work is that I'm going to go through the webinar. It'll be probably about 30 minutes of education, and then I will go through some Q&A at the end. So as you have questions or if you think of those questions and you want to type those in at the end of the webinar, we will spend um, probably 10 minutes or so, depending on how many questions there are, um, at the end going through those questions and uh, every webinar is recorded so if you want to reference back share it um, get the PDF please know that everything is accessible to you on the EBFA YouTube channel which is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness and if you want that PDF it is underneath the handouts of this control panel so please download that follow along or reference back at your own time if you are listening to this on a recorded version and you want the PDF, then please note that you can email me at education at ebfafitness.com and I will send you the PDF. So we are getting started on a very hot topic. Fascial tensioning is what EBFA is focused on throughout 2016. It's a topic that I'm very passionate about and I'm also very passionate about body weight training as well. I think it's a very, uh, Hot topic in the industry right now with CrossFit, kind of these gymnastics based CrossFit exercises, animal flow, body weight in general, uh, obstacle courses, parkour, etc. So, very, very hot topic. I'm going to be speaking um, of my perspective from both a clinician movement specialist, but also as a body weight athlete myself, and um, just things that I've kind of figured out on my own, and um, how I've been able to pull myself out of certain injuries, and actually achieve some uh, impeccable strength at my age, <laughs> but past my competitive years as a gymnast, that I actually feel like I'm stronger now that I'm I'm tapping into these fascial systems um, through this fascial tensioning technique, which is why I wanted to introduce this. So if this is your first time tuning in. My name is Dr. Emily Splickle. I'm a podiatrist, human movement specialist, and I'm in private practice in New York City. I'm the founder of the Evidence-Based Fitness Academy, which if you are not familiar with EBFA, please do check out our website at ebfafitness.com. We have three different certifications, including the Barefoot Training Specialist, Barefoot RX, which is more of a rehab perspective, and then Bare, which is our workout. All of the education through EBFA is focused on from the ground up, barefoot science, foot to core sequencing, and starting in 2016, we're going into the upper body with our BTS Level 3. And that's going to tie in some of this fascial tensioning concept as well. In addition, I have a book called Barefoot Strong, which is available on the EBFA website as well as Amazon. And in addition to all of this fun stuff that I do, I am a aerialist. And I started doing the um, aerialists or aerials uh, a year and a half ago. I was a competitive gymnast for 13 years, so it seemed like a natural transition to go into the aerial works, the silks, the trapeze, the lira, etc. And what I've learned through doing the aerial work and my understanding of fascia and fascia tensioning uh, has completely changed my perspective on um, training, conditioning, rehabbing my patients, including patients who have foot pathology. So it's quite fascinating and I want to share it with you guys. So you may not be an aerialist. Your clients or patients may not be body weight athletes. They might not be um, competitive to that perspective. However, I think that all of our clients, our patients, and ourselves really are considered body weight athletes. So even all of our day-to-day -day activities that we do, you could consider all of us body weight athletes. We need to understand how our body uses fascial tensioning to create stability, 
but also to create strength. And those are the two things that you want to think about when it comes to fascial tensioning. One, this is how your body creates dynamic joint stability, but it's also how your body generates force and power. I typically speak about fascial tensioning when I speak about proprioceptive training. And I actually change the way that I look at proprioceptive training and I pull all of my patients off of unstable surfaces and I put them more towards fascial tension training that is from the ground up and involves foot to core sequencing as a more effective technique to build dynamic joint stability. And I will be speaking about that more throughout this. So please note that fascial tensioning equates stability, but it also equates force and power. Okay. So if your goal is as a body weight athlete, you're trying to do squats, pull-ups, push-ups, um, running upstairs, taking impact forces, all of these things require you require you to understand how to tap into your fascial tension system. We often think about fascia as foam rolling, um, our body is integrated and interconnected through these myofascial webs. Um, that's often where pathology lies. That's where our elastic potential lies. Um, when we damp impact forces, we put that energy into our fascia. All of these things are correct. However, the area of fascia that we want to focus on as well is how through proper training of the tensile system of your fascia, you can actually create much more power when you're thinking of it from an athletic perspective or a fitness perspective. So all of your clients can benefit this, not just the ones who want to learn how to do handstands and dips and levers and plunges and etc. So we are all body weight athletes. Stability is the foundation through which power, force, and resistance is generated. You must be able to stabilize your joints. And we're ta talking about a deeper fascial stability. So when I often speak about foot to core sequencing in my BTS certification, the way that I explain it is that I want it to be this deeper fascial tone that exists in your body. I often tell in my core classes that I teach, is I want them to feel strong, but relaxed. And I'm going to show you an example of the differences of what this would look like is you should be in complete control of your body, almost like a ballet dancer or think kind of like how agile a cat is or parkour. They are strong, yet they are relaxed, right? Or some of the martial arts as well. That's the way that we want to be thinking about fascial tensioning and stability. So why do we want to focus on our fascia? Yes, it's a hot topic. Yes, everybody is foam rolling. But does our power or the secret to power and optimal force really lie within your fascia? It does. A few fascial facts that we have is that your fascia has 10 times as many sensory nerves as your muscles. And this is really interesting. This is based on research by Robert Schleip. If you've never read his research and you're looking for um, some forward thinkers when it comes to fascial fitness, I highly recommend checking out Robert Schleip's work. So his research had demonstrated that there's 10 times as many sensory nerves in our fascia versus in our muscles, which means that when you engage your muscles, let's say you do an abdominal brace or you were to engage your arms, what you actually feel, quote unquote, feel is your fascia tensioning. You're not actually feeling your muscles contract. So Understanding that difference is really important because us as movement specialists and trainers and coaches and physical therapists can actually change the way that we word these things to our clients and our patients is you should then start cueing and saying, do you feel your fascia tensioning? Because that's really what they're feeling. They're not feeling their abdominal muscles contract. They're feeling the fascia that runs through their abdominal muscles tensing. That slight difference is going to change the way that people actually start to perceive their body when it is contracting or tensing. So much more appropriate would be, do you feel your fascia tensioning? A second interesting fact that relates to fascia is that it's known as the organ of form. Now we often associate with fascia 
the word tensegrity. And tensegrity means tension that is integrated. So you have this tensile integrated unit or this myofascial web, which is actually designed to resist gravity. Through having this interconnected tensile web that has a slight tone, that truly is what is preventing your body from falling against gravity. The way that I often explain this of how it's evident in pathology with my patients is if you think about your myofascial system is interconnected with your tendons, your plantar fascia, your ligaments, your retinaculum, etc. Most of the pathology that we see is within our tendons. So we get bicep tendonitis, hamstring tendonitis, Achilles tendonitis, etc. So it's really not even in the muscles that you're feeling the pathology. It's within the fascia or these tendinous uh, units of our fascial system. So again, thinking about this organ of form and your fascia, which is resistant against gravity, is when I have a patient who has to stand for long periods because of their job, what they often present with is Achilles tendonitis and plantar fasciitis, which means that these are myofascial conditions or pathologies related to their body resisting falling against gravity. So again, understanding that the reason why you're getting plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis is because your whole myofascial web contracts against gravity. It has a baseline tone, which I think is quite fascinating. Third thing that we want to focus on and this one is going to really relate to fascial tensioning, is that your fascial system provides what's called an ectoskeleton for muscle attachment. This means that a lot of our muscles throughout our body actually originate and insert on our fascia, which means that when we look at how you actually create fascial tensioning, it's through the contraction of the muscle that you put tensile strength into your fascia. And the way that you're able to do that is because your muscles insert or originate on your fascia. So understanding that, very, very important. Last fascial fact that we want to look at is that our fascia contains collagen, elastin, myofibroblast. Myo means muscle. So the fibroblast found within fascia is actually smooth muscle-based. Muscle fibroblasts have an elastic potential within them, which means they're almost like a rubber band. They can be stretched and recoiled to have that elastic potential. That's very unique. And when that was found within our fascia, that really supported a lot of the research looking that are looking at how our fascia and our tendons are actually what provides that elastic recoil when we move. When you think about, again, walking, rhythmic movements, podiatry, again, kind of focusing on the, on the foot and ankle, the Achilles tendon, when we walk and when we do rhythmic movements, is really where a lot of your elastic potential lies. The reason why you have a lot of your elastic potential lying within your Achilles tendon is because it contains a high percentage of myofibroblasts. Understanding that should change the way that you actually create your programming to improve movement efficiency in your clients and in your patients. So very interesting fascial facts. I thought that the one particularly about the 10 times as many sensory nerves was really fascinating. So how do we tense our fascia, thereby creating stability? Because we're focusing on fascial tensioning. How specifically are we creating or putting tension into our fascia? Well, it's a certain type of muscle contraction, and it happens to be an isometric contraction. The way that I often explain so that people can grasp this concept is through an abdominal brace. Now, for everybody who's listening, if you were to do an abdominal brace, right, the reason why you do an abdominal brace, I'm doing my brace now as well, is to create tension or pressure in your intra-abdominal cavity. Now, the more tension or pressure that you're able to create in your intra-abdominal cavity, the more power or resistance or force you can put out. 
which means that if I'm going to lift something heavy, if I brace before I lift, it's going to be easier for me to lift the box or the weight, etc. If I'm going to kick, say I'm going to kick a bag, I want to create tension within my, my core or my intra-abdominal area, and then I will be able to generate more force and kick the bag harder. So the type of muscle contraction that you're doing when you do an abdominal brace is an isometric contraction. And if we think about the deep interconnected uh, makeup of the core, where it's the pelvic floor, the TVA, the internal obliques, the external obliques, the rectus abdominis, the multifidi, thoracolumbar, there's a huge myofascial web that's going on within the core, which means that's a huge opportunity for tension to be created within the intra-abdominal cavity. So again, to create core tension or intra-abdominal tension, what we do is we do a brace. The type of muscle contraction that a brace is, is isometric. So why is it isometric contractions which create this fascial tensioning and this this resistance or power through our fascial tensioning. Well, what's interesting is that isometric contractions put tension through a specific part of our fascia. And the part of the fascia that they put the tension through is the fascia that surrounds our muscle fascicles, which is the paramecium. Now, when we look at the muscle here, let's say that this is... Um, We'll say Achilles tendon because we're focused on the foot or I'm focused on the foot. Let's say this is your Achilles tendon going into your soleus, okay? So you have the tendon inserting onto the bone. That tendon is continuous with the bone in what is called a periosteum. So it's going to surround the bone almost like a saran wrap. And that's the continuous or the continuity of that fascial system. So surrounds the bone, goes into the tendon. Now the fascial system is continuing off of the tendon into the paramecium, which is pretty much the fascia that surrounds the entire muscle. Well, we know that our muscle can be broken down from primary muscle into muscle fascicles, which are then surrounded by the paramecium, which is what I had mentioned, holds most of your fascial tension outside of the, or in addition to the muscle fascicle, each of those muscle fascicles is a series of muscle fibers. And each of those muscle fibers is surrounded by fascia, which is referred to as the endomecium. Now of these, the one that holds the greatest amount of fascial tension is the paramecium. Does this really affect the way that you create your programming? Not necessarily. So understanding that it's isometrics that create fascial tension, and that is how you create power and stability, that's what we want to take home. However, if you like to dive in a little bit further and understand from a scientific perspective, really what part is taking that tension, it's the paramecium. So your paramecium has the highest density of myofibroblasts, which acts to transmit the forces through or created through that muscle. Isometric contractions create tension specifically within your paramecium. So it's the paramecium fascia that contains the highest number of myofibroblasts. So that is the reason why we're focusing on that part of your muscle. In addition to creating force and power tension, fascial tensioning also creates joint stability. Now, I focused on this a little bit when I had said that for my patients, I actually shifted them away from unstable surfaces, and I want them to do all of their rehab training on stable surfaces, but I want them to focus on foot-to-core sequencing and fascial tensioning, which means they're doing specific types of isometric contractions. Why I'm doing that is because fascial tensioning creates dynamic joint stability. The way that this happens is if we take a look at this fascia. So this is different angles of the foot and the ankle. What you can see what's very interesting is that the superficial fascia is 
very tightly interconnected with the retinaculum, the ligaments, the fascia, the tendons, all of this deep interconnected web is almost like a, a glove or a sleeve that surrounds your capsules. So now what happens if we take this picture here on the upper right, let's imagine that this is your ankle, it is your ankle, but let's, let's take this as your ankle and all of this fascia runs up into your lower leg muscles, your tibial anterior, perineals, gastroxoleus, et cetera, et cetera. Once you do an isometric contraction of your lower leg, what happens is all of this fascia gets pulled proximally and it tightens all of that fascia, ligaments, retinaculum, capsule that is surrounding your joint, which means you actually have a more stable joint. So that's how fascial tensioning creates joint stability. When you start to put tension through this myofascial web that is surrounding the joint here and you create tightness, what you do is you actually make it much more sensitive to shifts in that joint, which means you're getting a more accurate or finite joint proprioceptive awareness. Which is why, if you, let's say you're on a Dyna disc or a Bosu or a wobble board, anything that's unstable, you cannot contract your foot and your lower leg isometrically to the same degree as if you are on a stable surface, which means you're not going to get that same proximal fascial pulling and tightening of that joint. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so... What we want to do is ask ourselves, should we be doing, because I know some other um, education bodies speak about tension. And if you've never heard the term body tension, tension is something that was used or is often used in gymnastics, particularly. And um, as I had mentioned in the beginning, I was a competitive gymnast for 13 years. So the concept of body tension was just built into um, my philosophy of movement since, since I was six years old. And a lot of the drills that are now used in CrossFit and body weight conditioning and parkour, et cetera, like different hollows and things like that, those are all gymnastics based. And that's what has been done for years to teach the gymnasts how to keep keep optimal control of their body and to create force and to transmit force through the body at very high velocities. So if you are not able to create the certain degree of body tension that a gymnast can, one, you're not going to be able to do the tumbling tricks because you need to have this additive effect of tension but you could also injure yourself because of the rate at which you're tumbling. You have up to 18 times your body weight and forces going through your body, which is fascinating to be doing a tumbling pass and have 18 times your body weight. You must be like a machine to take that impact. So where body tension is often used in a fitness perspective is in kettlebell training. And I don't know if anyone, any listeners are strong first certified or taken any strong first training, but it's often referred in their education about body tension, which I think is awesome. I absolutely love how strong first speaks about that. And they do a lot of barefoot, which is obviously always, always up my alley. Now, one thing that I do um, challenge everybody who's listening to question is, is there a benefit to doing total body tension? So if you were to uh, sit or stand as you are, and if you're new to tensioning, a way that you can start to feel it is if you were to engage your core. So we'll do, let's see this. So if you were to engage your core and do a brace, if you hold that brace, and now I want you to actually just clench your fists. So what you've done is you've added another layer of tension throughout your body. If you engage your core, clench your fists, and then push your digits down into the ground. So now we have even more of these isometric contractions or tension being put throughout the body. As you add these different areas of 
tension or isometric contractions to different parts of the body, you should feel that there's this internal resistance that becomes greater, greater, greater as you add these different areas of the body. Now, the downside to this is that one, I could stand here and I could contract my feet, I could contract my quads, my butt, my core, my shoulders, my arms, and I could essentially look like this. Is that really the way that we want to train our clients or our patients or athletes to use tension? Do we want to be kind of like a linebacker that you're not going to be able to knock me over because I'm contracting every single muscle in my body and I have all this resistance? Or do we want to be more like, think Bruce Lee, like a martial artist? Do we want to somehow have this strong but relaxed element to the way that our body moves. And it's I, I don't have the answer to this, but I want to kind of put it out there and have you guys think about the difference of how people look at tension and power. Is do we want to be more like this, kind of like that linebacker, or do we want to be more artistically smooth, strong but relaxed? This is why I focus on what I call fascial tension zones. And this is something that we're actually adding into the BTS education starting in 2016, starting now. <laughs> so these fascial tension zones that I focus on are instead of you contracting every single inch of your body to be solid, yes, you're going to be strong, but do I really want you to be like that linebacker tense? Because you can't, if you're that much contracted or you're that tense, you can't move. However, when we move, when I'm walking, if I'm doing um, a, a certain move, say I'm doing, I'm a dancer and I'm doing a certain routine, I have this baseline tension that exists throughout my body. Just because I'm moving doesn't mean that I lost my tension. Every single inch of my body is not tense, but I have tension that still exists within these fascial tension zones. And the four zones that I want to focus on is, first zone is the foot, of course. Second zone is going to be the deep core slash pelvic floor. Third is the shoulder, and fourth is the hand. And this is a way that you can work with these different zones together, and you actually want to sequence them. So you want your zone one, which is your foot, to obviously sequence with your deep core. This is what in BTS we refer, refer to as foot-to-core sequencing. So foot-to-core sequencing is how you actually want to be moving. That's the way that you want to be squatting. You want to have that, that tone when you're running and you're striking the ground. If you don't have that sequencing between your foot and your core, your glutes cannot fire as much, you get injury, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to run through these and give you some programming that you can use as well. So remember that fascial tension zones are additive and you want to be training them as such. So zone one is going to be the foot. The exercise that we're going to do when we activate the foot or engage fascial tension throughout the foot is of course going to be short foot. I'm sure almost everybody who's listening to this has heard short foot. If it is a new exercise to you, then uh, I'm very excited for you to experience this because short foot has completely changed my practice and when you truly integrate it and for those who are listening I know many of you have taken my workshop and have given me um, or shared with me some of your experience with your patients and your clients which is just so exciting how they're responding to doing short foot and the foot to core sequencing that is a result of short foot. So when we do short foot is you always want to make sure that you're doing one foot at a time. I always start with one foot and then go on to two feet. First, one leg is in front, other leg is in back. In this picture that you can see me, you would actually want your chest up. I'm just trying to put down to my foot. But you want to have one leg forward, one leg back. Please make sure that that knee is bent. Very, very important. Short foot creates a locking mechanism throughout your lower extremity. So if your knee is straight, you create shearing forces on your knee joint and your meniscus because your knee is extended. So please make sure that you always have that knee slightly flexed. You want to start by finding your foot tripod. 
which is underneath the first metatarsal head, fifth metatarsal head, and heel. Lift the digits, spread them out, and place them down onto the ground. When you place them down onto the ground, what you want to do is engage or root the digits down into the ground. So do not think about pulling the digits in. You almost want to visualize that if your digits are spread and they're, and they're pressing down into the ground, almost visualize that there's a piece of paper underneath your toes and you're trying to keep somebody from pulling that piece of paper out from underneath the toes, which means that you're pushing straight down. You're not trying to pull the paper back away from them. You're just trying to keep them from pulling that paper away. It should be, again, strong but relaxed. So your breath should remain relaxed as you're holding this short foot position for 10 seconds, and then we release. You would do the same thing on the other side. So knee is bent, foot tripod, spread the digits, and then start to root the digits down into the ground. When you do that, again, focus or visualize that somebody's trying to pull a piece, or piece of paper out. You're trying to hold it there, 10 seconds. Try to maintain nice and relaxed. Are we strong and relaxed? Hold, hold, 10 seconds, and then release. Okay? Zone two, <coughs> excuse me, is going to be the pelvic floor. Now, the exercise that I do for the pelvic floor, this is a pelvic floor activation that um, the video to this can be found on the EBFA YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness, which is exactly where this YouTube, uh, this webinar will be found as well. And I base this on um, uh, a cueing that was used by Shirley Sarman, who is amazing with the pelvic floor. And I highly encourage you to check out her work as well. I'll have people be on, on the floor with the knees bent, feet flat. And if you're going through this with me, we might as well do this so that we can feel it. And what you want to do is find a neutral spine. So try not to be in an anterior tilt or a posterior tilt. Hands are on your pelvis so that you can make sure that the pelvis is not moving when you're doing this engagement. You want to shut your eyes. And the reason why I encourage people to shut their eyes is because the pelvic floor is a very um, internal sensitivity type muscle. So you want to, by shutting your eyes, you can then visualize a little bit more on how these muscles are contracting. What I like people to focus on is that they're not doing a Kegel. So I actually do not cue a Kegel, a traditional Kegel in, in the sense that a lot of us think about it is very anterior pelvic floor focused. What I want you to focus on is actually getting a little bit more of your posterior pelvic floor. And the reason why is because the posterior pelvic floor is actually myofascially connected to the deep sacral fibers of your glute max, as well as into your deep hip, and which runs up into the diaphragm and then into the psoas. So different parts of the pelvic floor a lot of us, it's easier to activate the anterior pelvic floor. So I try to get people to focus a little bit more on the posterior pelvic floor, which would be more of your levator ani muscles. So you're on your back, knees are bent, feet are flat on the floor, hands are on your pelvis, your eyes are shut, and you're going to visualize that the base of your pelvis is like the face of a clock. 12 o'clock is going to be your pubic symphysis. 6 o'clock is going to be your coccyx bone. 6 o'clock sorry, three o'clock is going to be your right hip bone. And then nine o'clock is going to be your left hip bone. Visualizing on 12 o'clock and six o'clock, you want to draw these numbers closer to each other and try to feel that you're actually drawing six o'clock towards 12 o'clock versus the other way around. So by drawing six o'clock up towards 12 o'clock, you should start to feel that you are engaging your posterior pelvic floor. Holding that tension there, you want to start to lift the pelvic floor or lift that tensile zone up towards the crown of your head. So there should be a drawing in and a lifting of the pelvic floor up through the crown of the head, hold 10 seconds, and then release. Again, the exact same thing, 12, 6, 6 o'clock draws to 12 o'clock, lift through the crown of the head, hold there, make sure that you're breathing the entire time, hold, hold and then relax. I typically like to do five repetitions. And then in addition, on the YouTube channel, there are uh, variations of this pelvic floor exercise that you can do. 
Now what we want to do is we actually want to sequence zone one with zone two. And this is where we're going to start getting into how your body generates power and force. So what we want to do is go back to our short foot position. So you want to have your right leg forward and your left leg back. We're not going to do the exercise here yet, but what I want you to do is right leg forward, left leg back, knee is bent, foot tripod, spread your digits, place them back down onto the ground. Now, before you do short foot, I want you to actually engage your core. So lift the pelvic floor or engage your TVA so you're putting tension in zone two. While holding tension in zone two, I want you to start to push your digits down into the ground. So now you're putting tension in zone one or your foot. What you should feel is now your foot and your pelvic floor are speaking to each other or are sequencing. I don't know if anyone um, who's listening, if as soon as you had the pelvic floor engagement and you engaged your foot, did you actually feel like the tension within your core actually increased? You should have, and we can actually pay attention to that next time. So let's go to the left side. So left leg is forward, right leg is back, knee is bent, find your foot tripod, place the digits back down onto the ground, engage your core first, hold the tension, now find short foot. As soon as you engaged your foot, did you feel like the tension or resistance within your intra-abdominal cavity got higher? You should have, <laughs> because that is the foot to core sequencing that happens when we do short foot or fascial tensioning from the ground up. Now, these exercises that you can do are many, and many, many of these exercises are ones that I demonstrate throughout the BTS certification, and they are all listed on the EBFA YouTube channel as well. There's a playlist that's called Run Injury Free. And there's a video that says single leg short foot exercises. And those are different exercises that you can do to sequence the foot with the core. So we're talking a deadlift, just like in this picture here, a side lunge, a single leg squat, a curtsy squat. So different exercises that you're using the foot and the core together to create resistance. A way that you're able to actually sequence zone one with zone two is that we would want to take it a little bit further and you can actually add zone three, which is going to be your shoulders. So here what I'm doing in this exercise, and you could almost visualize how if I had weights in my, in my arms, is in my bottom leg. So I have short foot on my right foot, my pelvic floor is engaged, and my rotator cuff, lats, and lower traps are engaging as I'm bringing my arms out. So I'm actually isometrically engaging my scapula stabilizers at the same time as short foot and my pelvic floor. When you do that, you should actually feel that you create more tension within your core. Remember that these zones are additive. Okay, so that's just one example of how you can sequence zone one with two with three. So now we want to talk about the upper body a little bit, and we are almost done here, but because this is kind of my new obsession because of all of my um, aerials and uh, gymnastics rings and bars and things like that, is how you can actually tap into more strength and actually better, optimal, faster shoulder slash scapular stability when you do fascial tensioning from the hand into the shoulder. And the way that you want to do this, you should kind of get down, and if you can get down on the floor and go through these exercises at the same time, that would be ideal. So in the picture on the left, what I'm doing is I'm doing a straight arm side plank, but we're going to start with a push-up plank position. So you want to have your shoulder directly over your elbow, over your wrist, and make sure that you're splaying your fingers as wide as you can. Your second finger or your pointer finger is actually the midline of your um, hand, almost like the second digit is the midline of your foot. So you want to make sure that your pointer finger is facing forward. And it makes, it actually sets your shoulders in a better position when you do that. Okay. So 
Point your fingers pointing forward. You want to externally rotate your shoulders. So wrap the shoulders back so that the crease of your elbow is facing forward. That's the position that your shoulder is going to be more stable. What often happens when um, patients experience or clients experience shoulder impingement or like an AC bursitis in the shoulder or bicep tendonitis, all of those things mean that they have this internal rotation or a unstable shoulder joint, primarily in an internally rotated position. So I'm very particular on cueing that external rotation. All right, so fingers are spread, pointer finger is forward, externally rotate the shoulders. Now, before you even come up to the rest of your push-up plank, I want you to root your digits down into the ground. So now, kind of like you were doing short foot, is push your fingertips down onto the ground. So your body weight is on the heel of your hand and on the tips of your fingers. So that would be your six points of contact, okay? As you do that, you want to hold that tension there. Then you're going to lift into your push-up plank, and you're going to tuck your pelvis under so you have a slight posterior tilt so you can get a little bit more tension in the abdominals. However, we're not talking about the core yet. I want you to just focus on rooting the digits down into the ground and how you feel that tension wrap all the way up into your shoulders. What we're doing is we're activating your shoulder stabilizers or we're creating tension throughout the upper extremity. Okay? What I would have you do or have clients do is hold that for 10 seconds, hold, 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 root the digits down, and then release. Do a series of those, and then to do the side plank one very similar to the picture here is you would want to do again very similar, is spread the digits, and then make sure that your shoulder is elbow, shoulder over elbow over wrist, externally rotate the shoulder so that the crease of the elbow is facing forward, root your digits down into the ground, and then start to lift up into that side plank position. You want to keep the shoulder externally rotated, and the chest should be square. So if you can see here that my shoulders are staying stacked and my arm that looks like it's cut off, typically I lift it up and I actually open it all the way out and rotate my chest open even more. Reason why I'm doing that is because I really want to emphasize external rotation of the shoulder. I've had very, very bad bicep tendonitis, and through doing these different techniques, I was able to actually rehab myself out of this bicep tendonitis. So, holding there, hold that for 10 seconds, great. Do the same thing on the other side, okay? So that is to get our, our hand activated. So now what we want to do <coughs> is that we want to sequence zone three with zone four, which is, again, very similar. This is what we were doing. This is how we prime our upper extremity through fascial tensioning. Just like short foot, root the digits down into the ground, feel how it goes into the pelvic floor. What we're doing here is that we're rooting the hand down, feel how it goes into the shoulder, and then you can actually connect the shoulder into your pelvic floor as well. So you're focusing and remembering these different zones. So instead of just locking out the entire body, what I want you to do is try to feel where your tension lies so that the rest of your body can be a little bit more relaxed. So here. These are the activation exercises, hands down, no pun intended, that I highly, 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 highly recommend before doing any of your handstand work, any of your pull-up work, any of your push-up work, any ring work, et cetera, et cetera. The way that you can take this a little bit further is if you are doing ring work, bar work, silks, whatever, it doesn't matter what you're doing, is... Here on the picture on the right, what I'm doing after I activated my hand to shoulder is I get on the bar, and when we hold on, the finger that's actually more important for hanging grip is digits five and four. So I'm focusing primarily on 
tension throughout my pinky finger and my fourth finger holding on to the bar so that's the tension within my hand but then the tension zone that I'm really relying on is my shoulders and I'm externally rotating my shoulders and isometrically contracting my shoulder stabilizers and sequencing it with the hand I then can actually sequence then that with my core so for anyone who has done pull-ups, you know that a pull-up is a core exercise. It is all about body tension. And those clients who can just not get a pull-up, particularly women, what you want to do is you want to teach them how to build fascial tension really through the deep core pelvic floor. The stronger that you can get your hand and your pelvic floor to work together, the easier the concept of a pull-up will be and a push-up for that matter as well. So here, the sequencing on the bar on the right, I'm engaging my hands, but focusing on digits 5-4, and I'm externally rotating my shoulder, engaging my scapular stabilizers isometrically, and then I'm actually doing a hollow, or I'm engaging my lower deep abdominals, and I'm holding that for 10 seconds. However, where my grip strength is coming from is from my shoulders. So grip strength is dependent on the isometric fascial tension of your shoulder stabilizers. And then that you obviously can progress to any different exercise. On the left, I'm doing a single arm hang. Where again, the most important thing when I'm doing that exercise is in my mind, I'm focusing on, not on the grip, like do not let go of this bar with one hand, but I'm focusing on my scap stabilizers and ensuring that my shoulder stays externally rotated while sequencing that with my deep core pelvic floor. That tension through those fascial tension zones is what's going to create a lot more power. So what do you do? And we're totally wrapping up here. I know this is going way long, longer than I thought it would be. What do you do if your client is injured or not a bodyweight athlete? How can you use the concept of fascial tensioning with them? Well, there are many exercises. You, it, it's not just bodyweight exercises. It's not just gymnastics-based exercises. If your client has no intention to do a pull-up, et cetera, they're just kind of, that's beyond where they want to go. Focusing on these different exercises through these fascial tension zones. I have a lot of different videos on the EBFA YouTube channel that speak about body tension and how you can sequence it from foot to core. That's going to be short foot pelvic floor. That's the basis of the bear workout and a lot of the BTS programming or BTS level one. And then you want to start to sequence that with foot to core into the shoulder. So that would be something like a military press, a bicep curl, things like that. The way that you can take that a little bit further from foot to core, shoulder into hand would be anything that would be really like grip intensive. So any of the ring work, pull up work, etc. Knowing that those fascial tension zones, very, very important. If you want to learn more about fascial tensioning, our certifications, etc., please check out ebfafitness.com. Again, if you've attended any of our Barefoot Training Specialist in before 2016, please know that we are changing it to then um, integrate a lot of this fascial tension concept. And, uh, of course, we have all our other training. So all of it is available on ebfafitness.com. So I will go through any questions. And I know that um, a lot of people are typing in that they cannot download the handout. Do not worry. What you can do is email me at education at ebfafitness.com and I will email it to you. So please, again, education at ebfafitness.com and I will email you that PDF. I'm not quite sure why it's working. All right, so question. Um, let's see, yes, it was really increasing. Um, yes, so there is um, what uh, Rebecca actually has mentioned, which is great, is she has said that she actually started doing isometric contractions before she does her resistance training. So when she's trying to get um, 
higher hypertrophy or strength gains. And there's a lot of research around that for everybody who is um, still tuned in or for Rebecca. That's actually something that I was going to include and I had it on my mind and then I forgot it. But there is a lot. So you can actually use this concept of fascial tensioning before you do your heavy lifts. So some of the research that I um, remember reading when I was getting my master's is that uh, these rowers would do an isometric lat hold and they would like pull on a, a bar that allowed them to do an isometric hold and they would hold, 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 and then they would row and their times with rowing would actually be better. So a lot of that, yes, has to do with the CNS activation. So anytime you do an isometric contraction, you get the highest motor neuron firing, which is why activation exercises are isometric. However, what you're also doing, and what I think there's not a lot of research yet around it, is that when you do an isometric, you're essentially like priming your fascia to then store that power. So it probably is a combination of both. And when you start training your fascia that way through that isometric, how you actually said that you've seen your, your greatest hypertrophy gains ever, when you start training your fascia in this way, like fascial tensioning way, the changes that you have in your body are amazing. So I definitely think it's CNS activation, Rebecca, but I also think that it's also that you're priming your fascia for that upcoming load. All right. Um, you are so welcome for who said that. Um, how do you handle an obese client and try to do fascial tensioning for her? So you can, just because someone is obese doesn't mean that you know their fascial system is exactly like everyone else's. Um, you're probably not having them doing fascial tensioning in the sense of like pull-ups and you know ring work and things like that. However, short foot taps into the fascial tension system. So I would hands down do that. I would teach them even if you're doing like a quadruped work, um, you know, knee, forearm planks, not even like crazy advanced things, start to teach them how to tap into their fascial system through the fingers and through the digits. So everything that I spoke about can still apply to all of our patients, regardless of their body weight, their fitness level, their injury level, et cetera. Uh, for distance runners and swimmers, absolutely as well. So for distance runners, I would do the foot to core sequencing through short foot, like five minutes, and do it as a way of movement prep. I didn't speak about, this one was focused on fascial tensioning. I have a, another webinar that I did in a uh, foot fascial functional movement webinar series, which is actually a CEC webinar series. Um, and that was a paid one that I spoke about fascial elasticity. So that would be a little bit more in the distance runners uh, for that question. And fascial elasticity allows our body to take load repetitively in a very rhythmic fashion. So that's a little bit different than fascial tension. That would be more the fascial, uh, ten uh, fascial elasticity. So fascial tensioning affecting blood pressure. So that's a really good question. And that's why I don't cue. If you think of kind of that linebacker bodybuilder person who's contracting every muscle in the body, when you think of that type of body tension, that makes me think about blood pressure going up. And that's why I also cue that in my classes is that even though they're doing a brace and they're holding their plank or they're doing something heavy is they must keep that uh, baseline of relaxation and breathing throughout it because I don't want their blood pressure to go up. So awesome, awesome question. And that's the way that I would kind of combat any risks of that affecting blood pressure is because I don't want them to, you know, if you're contract every single inch of your body, yes, your blood pressure is going to go up. So I always remember that tension should always be strong, but relaxed, that you should be able to be moving almost like a cat. Um, Okay, let's see if there's any other. Okay. 
Okay. Cues for shoulders. So I went into that a little bit. This will be my last question before we wrap up. Is um, with the shoulders uh, for Wayne is that I had cued that external rotation. So the hand to shoulder sequencing that I'm talking about is coupled with the external rotation. And again, that's based on a lot of shoulder impingement is associated with internal rotation. And if you put force through the shoulder and you're not able to maintain proper shoulder centration or keeping that humeral head in that centered position, what happens is you start to pinch the, uh, the tendons and the bursa underneath the AC joint in the shoulder. And that's where a lot of that pathology happens, rotator cuff tears, bicep tendonitis, et cetera. So maintaining an externally rotated position of the shoulder is very important. But the way that you feed into your external rotators, or the way that I like to do it, is through that hand engagement. So you're creating that sequencing. And then just making sure any of the work that you're doing, whether it's ring work, bar work, et cetera, handstands, any of that is that you're maintaining that externally rotated position. We kind of forget that once we get onto the bar and the rings and handstands and things is because your body's focused on just that complex skill, but you still need to maintain proper shoulder external rotation and shoulder stability throughout that exercise. So uh, I hope that that helps. All right. So we are wrapping up again for anyone who wanted the PowerPoint. Please uh, message me, education at ebfafitness.com. Otherwise, thank you everybody for tuning in. You can catch the recorded version on YouTube shortly, and we will be posting it on our social media as well. Thank you all, and have a wonderful new year.